always about what you are doing rather than what you're not doing. So what you are doing now is listening only to me. Okay, and that's a really good thing. That's what I want you to do right now. And I want you to start thinking about your goals really carefully. Because I think it's really funny how people don't set themselves goals. Or at least most people set themselves big goals. I want to have a million pounds by the time I'm 25. Or, uh, you know, I want a bigger house. But what about small goals? How many people of you here set the goal before you meet somebody? Set the goal before you go into a meeting? Set the goal before you go out on a date? Set the goal before you work with your kids? It's really important. And when you're setting the goal, there's a really good order to do that in. And I learned this from a wonderful teacher Michael Breen, who if, you, if, you're, if you're in business and doing NLP and you want to do business NLP, he's the governor. And he taught me a really interesting rule. That's the rule. Whenever you're planning, whenever you're making goals, first of all, have a think about the state. It's the big picture. It's the meta program. How many people actually plan the state that they want to be in and that they want the other people to be in at the end of the meeting, the day after the date? What's the state you want to be in when you leave here tomorrow? What's the state you want to be in when you leave here tonight? So I have some suggestions for you. If it was me sitting in the audience, the first thing I'd be deciding is tonight, I want to be feeling quite excited about what I'm learning, but remaining open. I don't yet want to have closed. And, and once you think you've understood something or you've got it, you know, in NLP, we always say understanding is the booby prize when you're learning. Because what happens as soon as you think, ah, oh, oh, I understand it, is that's when you close. While you're still curious, while you're still in the state of, I know there's more, I wonder what it is, then you're going to stay open to find out. So if it was me sitting where you are, I'd want to be going at the end of today feeling quite excited about what I'd learned, starting to think about where it might be useful, but still not closed. I'd want to be holding that state open to more. Bless you. And then tomorrow, if it was me, I'd be wanting to be interested in what else I could find out after the course and to try this stuff out live in a real life scenario. What's it like when I speak to my son in a particular way, or my boss, or somebody else at work? So that's just my personal feelings about it. You have your own. How do you want to be? Because I think that it's really important. You know, if you got in an aeroplane and you'd bought your ticket to JFK and the pilot didn't bother to set the controls, you might not end up in JFK. You might end up in Timbuktu. You've got to set the direction for yourself. So if you just have a look in your workbooks for a moment, you'll see there's a page called Your Goals. Whereabouts? Yeah, good question. <laughs> About halfway through. After how sound works and before. There's two pages about goals. One says your goals, and one says vocal strengths and goals. And you can have a look at both of them. So, yeah, you know, what is it that you've come here for? 
Now, just think about it, because maybe some of you have come here because you don't want to be nervous in front of a group, because you don't want to shout at your wife, because you aren't achieving something and you think your voice is too quiet. What I want to know is what you do want, okay? That's the way to set a goal. All you NLPers, you know this. The goal needs to be set in the positive. So what is it that you do want? And I want you to talk that through and bring it down to about three really good goals. You can have some side issue goals as well. But give yourself three really good goals so that you can get there. And then I want you to decide whether those goals are compelling enough. We all need to have that feeling of motivation when you're going for a goal. It's got to feel good to achieve it. Are your pictures big enough? Are they bright enough? Are they colourful enough? Are the sounds rich and clear and loud when you imagine having achieved it? This is straight NLP, okay? But I want you to apply this to what we're doing here today. What is it you want to be able to do? Okay? Take Five minutes apiece, talk this through and get this really honed so that then we can start really aiming you in the direction of having achieved it. Tell me, what was the, what was the two? Have confidence to speak in front of, uh, of a group. Okay, so speaking confidently would be a goal for you, regardless, actually, not just in front of a group, but... Right, so are you all now feeling very enthusiastic about achieving what you're here to achieve? Yay! Good, that's what we want. Okay, so now it's just the how-to. Let me ask you a question. Would any of you consider running a marathon without warming up your muscles? Yes. Yes. <laughs> You'd consider it and then decide against it or be a fool. Because, you know, every day you're walking around, you're doing various things, but if you have to do something really strenuous, you need your muscles to be warmed up. And it's exactly the same with a voice. Uh, people just expect to be able to get up on a stage, speak to 300 people for four days and, be, and retain the flexibility and strength that they had on day one without warming up. So there are ways of warming up your voice and I think what we should do now is get a good warm-up routine so that you can really feel how much easier it is for you to do various things that we're then going to be doing. So put your books on the floor. Now, the first thing is just track back to the breathing we were doing earlier. And for anybody that feels comfortable doing it, do it again. So you breathe out and you let the air come back in and just set up that pattern where you're breathing from deep down. It doesn't have to be hugely deep breaths, but just make a point of breathing lower down in your body rather than in your chest. If your shoulders are relaxed, it's easier to breathe from your diaphragm, which is where you want to be breathing from. Good. Now, jump up. Have a big stretch and a big yawn. Doesn't matter if it's not real. Really open your mouth and stretch. Now, anybody here that didn't open their mouth fully, we're going to do it again, OK? I want you to feel the stretch at the side of your jaw. It's important. I'm examining. I need to know how many people have fillings, whether they're white ones or silver ones. And I want to see them. When you yawn, your tongue goes down at the back of your throat. It is the one time when your throat is completely open. It's a brilliant exercise. All my stammerers have to do this. If they tell me that they're getting spasms in their throat, I'm going to send them away with a prescription for 10 yawns twice a day because it's really good for your throat. One more then. Big yawn. Oh, that's right. 
And now just bend forward and flop so that you really let any tension drain out of your shoulders, drain out of the ends of your fingers, let your head flop. And then slowly come back up. Good. Now just give your shoulders a little rub because most people hold tension in their shoulders and you have 33 muscles feeding into your vocal tract and they're all in your upper chest and shoulders. Any tension in your shoulders is going to be audible in your voice. So give your shoulders a massage. That's it. And then push your shoulders down further than you would normally have them. Really stretch your neck. And then relax them back up. And imagine that you have a string coming out of the top of your head, pulling your neck so that you can feel your neck elongate at the back. And if you continue to need to yawn, that's it, do it big. And then what I want you to do is to make this sound. If you can't do it, relax your lips more, lick them. And now can you do that without the voice so that it sounds like this? That's it. If you can't do it, again, relax your lips more. You're doing this as a muscle training. So the idea of it is that you do it fully. I don't care what you're doing. Get this all working. Doesn't have to have any words to it at all. Just sounds. Get some sounds from your lips. Get some sounds from the back of your mouth. Any sounds that you can make, make them over and over again while you look at somebody in the eye. Okay, off you go. Three minutes. Do it quick. Good. Now, what I want you to do is just go to one person, if you like, the person sitting next to you, and just tell them how you got here this morning and listen to the sound of your voice because I want you to keep calibrating. Does it sound richer? Does it sound fuller? Does it sound easier? So just calibrate it, check into it. Just tell them how you got here today. Blue. Content not important. Okay. So to me, that would be a very good warm up, except for one thing, we haven't centered our body. And that's really important too, particularly if you're going to be standing on a stage. Because there's a real difference seeing somebody standing on a stage, not looking or feeling grounded and centred. There's a really quick, easy way to do it. So just stand up, put your books down for a moment, okay? Put your arms up in the air like this, and then you jump and land. And where you land, that's where your feet are supporting your body most. Just notice how far apart your feet are. You need your feet that far apart to be properly grounded. Yep, okay. Now you take your attention. Who here has done one point, Hara, on an NLP course? Not everyone? Whoa, what, taking your attention down to Hara? We didn't do it? Oh, we've got to do that. Um, okay, have a seat, I've got to do a demo. Really important. So glad I did this on my NLP course. Okay, good. Well, now you get it here. So I need um, some help. Who's going to come and help me? Yay! Come on then. Have you done this before, Richard? No. Good. Okay. So here's the thing. First of all, I want you to put your feet together. And, uh, and I want you to think about something that's been a little bit difficult to deal with. Something that maybe didn't make you feel fabulous. Okay, and what I'm going to do is just test his centre of balance, okay? I just want to see how hard I have to push to knock him slightly off balance, all right? I haven't got one yet. What? Haven't you haven't got, got one yet. yet. Nothing makes you feel <laughs> <laughs> Got one. Okay, here we go. All right, so think about it. Okay, so I just... I'm just calibrating now what he feels like when he's a little bit worried. So not so easy to push him forward, pretty easy to push him back, and pretty easy to push him to the side.
not so easy on that side, but also a little bit easy. Okay. Now, in who, somebody here said they do martial arts. Who here does martial arts? There's one couple. Okay. In martial arts, you don't want to be a pushover. Uh, you need to be flexible, but you need to know where your center is. And there's something called hara. Have you heard of harakiri? When people committed suicide by cutting the life force at hara. It's about three finger widths below your belly button and halfway between your spine and your front. So just take your attention back to there. Put your feet in a position like when you landed. Okay, bring your attention to here. Hold it here. Just hold your attention here and let me see. Oh God, now I can't push you at all. Very good, not a chance. Not a chance. Using all my strength and I can't do it. Now you can feel the difference, can't you, between those two. Okay, let me ask you now, think about the thing that before you thought of that bothered you. Okay, but do it with your attention in horror. First, let me check if you're strong like a bull you have to be. Yes, he is strong. Very good. Okay, hold that while you think of the thing that was challenging. And does it feel different? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does it feel like you could deal with it better? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now, you know what? That's it. You've done it. Thank you. You're a great demonstration subject. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> and I always recommend, if you have to stand up on a stage, that the, what you do before you open your mouth, you have the breathing happening, you want to be standing really firm and have your attention in your center because you feel more powerful. It makes you feel more powerful. Your body and your mind is joined together. And your body responds, makes your brain respond to its position. Try something out. Sit like this. Okay, just put your head in your hands. Okay, try it out, try it out. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. Well, then just sit somehow, you know, like a miserable person and try and feel happy. Okay. It's really hard. Sit up again. Come back. How does somebody sit who's having a great time and feeling brilliant? Okay. Your mind calibrates your body. So it responds to it. If you're sitting in a position or standing in a position that feels insecure, then the thoughts, the kind of insecure thoughts, may come to mind. If you're standing like a strong person who's grounded, who's not a pushover, then those are the thoughts that come into your mind. You definitely want to be strong on your feet when you're standing up in front of a group. Now, we're going to move on to a slightly different topic, and that is how much energy you put into your communication. First of all, it has to vary, the same as everything else with a voice. You don't want to be using the same energy to speak from a stage to a group as you do in an intimate conversation. Think about it. Of course not. So do you know how your energy comes across? Now I want you to start getting real good feedback from your colleagues here today. One of the big advantages of working in a group is that you can get feedback from different people. Because voice is such a subjective experience, I bet that if I asked you all who your favorite voices are and which voices you don't like, I bet there'd be quite a few variations in the room. You know, not everybody loves Richard Burton, not everybody loves Sean Connery, but some people do. I had a, a, a survey, we did a survey across Britain and their sexiest female voice came out as Mariella Frustrup. Now, I don't know if any of you know her. She does the book program on Radio 4, and she has a very distinctive voice. But I don't like it. All right? In fact, I find it quite difficult to listen to for any length of time. It bugs me. But half of Britain thinks she's got the sexiest voice in the country. It's very subjective, what sounds really good to you. But you need to have the variety and to find out so that you can calibrate how much energy you use. 
for anybody that feels that they're sometimes too loud or too strident or too controlling, then you need to find out what's the level of energy that feels comfortable. So I want you to turn in your handout to my friend Fatima. It's called the Fatima Factor. You're going to take this exercise Where and it? it's on page... Halfway through. About halfway through. After what we've already been doing, before that. Next. No, one more. One more. No, you're going in the right direction. Yay! Have you all got it? Okay. So this exercise is to calibrate your energy level when you're with one person or a small group. And then you can just use the correlation of that for thinking about how much more you might need on a stage with 20 people, on a stage with 100 people. Because the sound waves are absorbed by people. They're going in through your skin and bone and vibrating you. That means some of it is getting lost. When you're in a room with soft furnishings and people, the more soft furniture and the more people, the more energy you have to use to sound exactly the same. So that's what this exercise is for. So here's how it goes. You read the first paragraph in your normal voice to somebody, a colleague. In fact, I'd like you to work in threes. So you're going to read it to two people. The second bit is where the evil thumb comes in for some of you, okay? Because I really want you to turn up the energy to maximum. That's going to be scary with you, okay? <laughs> That's okay. I want you to find out the edges. <coughs> Bless you. Okay, you're going to turn up the energy, okay? So I want you really to feel it in your body. And I want you to call people to come and see the fattest woman in the world. She weighs... 1,250 pounds. When you say turn up energy, you don't mean shout. No, I don't mean shout. I mean really use your energy. Ladies and gentlemen, in the tent behind me is Fatima. She's the fattest lady in the world. She weighs 1,250 pounds. It takes nine men to lug her and a tractor to tug her. Don't miss this chance. Get your tickets now. Okay, is just an excuse for turning up your energy. All right? I don't really care what you say, but it's quite a good little thing to read. And I want you to find out what's the most energy you can use. All right? Then I want you to take some of the Fatima energy and bring it to the paragraph at the end, which is the same as the paragraph at the beginning. So that you've then got three energy levels, right? The first one, which is just default reading it out. The second one, which is enormous, and the third one, which is in the middle. And I want you to get feedback. What feels comfortable for the people who you're talking to? What feels impactful? What feels exciting? Okay, now, of course, it's going to depend on whether you do it as just a kind of rah, or whether you do it as a rah. Your state will count. So we're, we're adding things in here. Start using your state as well. But just find out now how much energy. My guess is that the people who have quiet voices will think they're using more energy than is coming across. The people who have very loud voices here may think that, more, uh, that less is coming across. But I want you now to just start calibrating and finding out from the other people what's coming across. And you're going to use this to do it. So take 15 minutes, that gives you five minutes each to go through it, find out, and really come back with a, a better insight into how to use your own energy when you're communicating. Very important. Off you go. So, what I want to know is, did you find, did anybody notice here, 
that they thought they were putting out more energy or less energy than they were aware of, just out of interest. Good, so now that's a little bit of recalibration starting. That's really useful because if it was too little, then you know that what felt like too much is probably just normal. If it was too much, then you know to pull back a little bit. So it's a really important thing and there's no substitute for feedback. And by the way, that can be covert or overt. You're going to see if you're using too much energy. I find it really easy to up the energy. And sometimes I see people kind of backing away, my clients, and I just pull it back a little bit. So it's once, you, once you know what to watch for and listen for and how it feels inside, then you can really start playing with levels of energy. Because if you want to motivate people, if you want to excite them, if you want to inspire them, it's not about being loud, but it is about having the energy. Okay, so now you've got an idea of how to calibrate your energy a bit better. Is that right? You have? Because I want you to carry that with you for the rest of this weekend, because you're going to need your energy. And for the next exercise, which is the one just before tea, we're going to be paying attention to the tunes that you make with your voice. This is a really, really mm -hmm. important part of voice work. When my daughter was uh, young, <clears throat> Neighbours arrived in England, the TV programme, and everybody got Australian inflections. It's what happened. Before Neighbours arrived, people on the street used to use the word OK at the end of their sentence a lot. So they would say things like, uh, you know, I'm going down the shops, OK? Right? That was the way they did it. When Neighbours arrived, they dropped the OK and they'd just do, I'm going down the shops. Can you hear that? I'm going down the shops. Now, it's not really a question. My daughter used to say, people used to say, where do you live? And she'd say, I live in Richmond. Now, I just want you to notice what that does. I live in Richmond. What does it make you feel like? Well, I tell you what it does to me. When somebody says, I live in Richmond or I live in Camberwell, it makes me want to nod because what I feel like is that they're asking for my approval or they're asking me to acknowledge that I know where Camberwell or Richmond is. That's a questioning pattern. When you have a rising inflection, something has to come next. That's what a rising inflection is. It tells you I'm not finished. Now, how much your voice goes up and how much it comes down is going to change the way you interpret it. So if I say to you, shut the door, just notice what it feels like. Now, I'm going to try slightly less. Shut the door. Notice what that feels like. Now, I'm going to try shut the door. If you were to say please on the second one, then that would be better. Okay, let's put a please on there. Let's see if it makes a difference. Please shut the door. Or shut, can you shut the door, please? Can you shut the door, please? Right, just notice. You think it's the words, it's the inflections. Mm -hmm. Can you shut the door, please? Right. Mm -hmm. Can you shut the door, please? Can you shut the door, please? Can you shut the door, please? Now, each one of those means something different, doesn't it, to you? And each one is going to get a different response. The bigger the fall, the more commanding it is. The more your inflection drops, the more commanding it sounds. Now, there are some people that like being commanded, by the way, and that are going to want to hear that. Okay. And sometimes it's really urgent that you really are very commanding. Sometimes when you're speaking to small children, you really need that. And children respond so much to inflections. They pick them up and they respond absolutely. And, you know, it's different with different children, but to find out which ones your children respond to is really useful. Then you get to be able to ask them to tidy up their room and to sit nicely at the table once you start knowing which inflections to use. 
Some people love the feeling of a rising inflection when it isn't a question. Because what a rising inflection does is it opens it. Okay, if I'm using lots of rising inflections, my guess is that you're going to perceive me as more friendly. If I'm using lots of falling inflections, my guess is you're going to perceive me as authoritative, or more authoritative, more commanding. So for each of you, there's probably going to be a story where you could do with a little bit more of one or the other. I often have to work with people and teach them rising inflections because they're very authoritative, okay, very commanding. Then it's useful to incorporate more rising inflections because it's friendly. It's open. It's like now it's your turn. And then there's things that combine all of them together, like the way you said, please, can you shut the door? Okay, there's when you do, uh, uh, uh. That's called a children's pattern. It's called a negotiating pattern because a little bit of both. Uh, there's the falling inflection, which is a statement or a command, plus a rising inflection, which is a question, and they're all muddled up together, so it's kind of all things. But it's not clear. It's not concise. <coughs> Bless you. And it can, if you use too many of those, it can sound a bit cloying. Oh, Mum! Please, can't I? Okay, you hear that a lot with kids. They use it a lot. They're telling you that that's what they want <coughs> and please would you give it to them? If you want to be really clear and concise, you're just going to use straight falling inflections or straight rising inflections because it's clear. There's one other pattern. Only one other possible pattern. And it's called lists. So when you're giving people a list of things, if you want them to hear right to the end, you need to use rising inflections until the last one. One, two, three, four. Get it? Okay, you can hear it, can't you? Um, we, we ate, we ate, we drank champagne and we danced. We went to a movie, we went for a meal, and then we went home to bed. Okay, whatever it is, the last one falls. Let's just see what happens if we drop the inflection before the last one. Listen carefully. Uh, there's rain, there's sun, there's cloud, there's wind, and there's snow. Do you lose the last one a little bit? Yeah. yeah. Because what happens is as soon as you hear a list, when you hear the falling inflection, your brain goes close. So, lists. One, two, three, drop. Ready, steady, not yet, go. Now, in your handouts, you've got a number of phrases. <clears throat> I've just come up with some random phrases to use. Where is it? It's this one, inflections, the meaning behind the tunes. And at the bottom of the page... Sorry, I noticed you put two on me in the list rather than four. I scan it quickly. Oh, I just put two. Those are the two important ones. But I'm giving you all the rest here. Make a note. Okay, so here at the bottom of the page are some examples. Try it on sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Right, so you try all the different flavours of inflections and find out what's going on so that you become more deliberate in the way that you use your voice, so that you know how to guide somebody's state just with the inflections. Down. <laughs> sit down. Okay, good. It's now, the going on. sit down. It's a question. Sit down. Right, sit down. Okay, sit down. Sit down. Sit down. Yeah, that's more. Sit down. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> Give me your hand. Right, okay, ready? Sit down. Sit down. Start low. Sit, Sit down. down. 
Sit down. Good. Again. Sit down. Beautiful. Sit down. Again. Let's keep, hold focus, because we're going to do a really important thing next, which is to go through the list of the different pieces of what's going on with a voice, because tomorrow we're going to be exercising every single aspect of your voices, so that by the time you leave here, every stone has been turned and every <laughs> aspect of your voice, bless you, every aspect of your voice will have been exercised so that what comes out without any effort is just something much more flexible and much more controlled. But in order to do that, you have to know what the list is. So here's the list. It's called Voice, a vocal checklist for your specific goals. So let's just run through what all these things mean and have a think about them. Now, some people say, I speak too fast. Some people say, not so many, say, I speak too slow. Some people say, when they're nervous <coughs> and under pressure, Gesundheit, they speak too fast. But actually, the truth is, the only important thing is to get variation. Okay. It's the variation that makes your voice interesting, that puts the emphasis in there. If you always speak at the same speed, it's going to sound like when you always <laughs> speak on the same note. Anything you do the same all the time is going to become boring. Now, the next one on the list is the quality. What happens when I make the quality of my voice not quite so pleasant? OK, I just want you to listen. Now, there are plenty of people that talk like this. So if I would got up here this morning and said, good morning, everybody, my name's Laura Spicer, I wonder what would have happened in terms of the way you would have filtered the information coming to you after that. Because, you see, what I think happens is when something is really unpleasant, and remember, the sound waves are going into your body. So if it feels unpleasant and sounds unpleasant, what most people want to do is kind of close it off. That's what it feels like. It's a bit like if somebody's hitting you, you want to do that to stop it. So if my voice was really unpleasant, how long do you think I could speak before you do that? <laughs> okay, it's horrible. Now that's a really exaggerated version. And pretty much everybody here, as far as I can think, has got pretty nice quality. It's very important. And the quality is all about where you're breathing from, which muscles are tense, which muscles are relaxed. That's what makes the quality. Now, your pitch range. Pitch is a funny word because some people think it means volume. But in terms of your voice, it means how high and how low you speak. And, and what is the difference between your highest note and your lowest note? If you speak in a narrow pitch range, there's going to be boringness in there. It's just going to sound monotonous. If you stay at roughly the same tone all the time in terms of which notes you're using, just notice what it sounds like to you. Okay? As I keep my pitch range very narrow, and I tell you about, you know, the fun we had and the sad time we had. There's no emotion. Okay. Emotion is expressed through pitch range. But equally, too wide a pitch range can be incredibly annoying when you hear people saying, well, I went down to visit my friend and she said to me, okay, ah! okay, lots of people do it. It sounds pretty crazy as you're listening to me now, but lots of people do it. So finding out what's a good wide pitch range, but not too much, is going to be important. We're going to be doing that tomorrow. And it's the same with the volume. And you know, here's what I think. There's a spectrum. It's not loud or quiet. There's a spectrum. 
there's too quiet at one end and too loud at the other end, but in between there's a whole area that you can play with. And in that playing with it, making some things a little bit louder and some things a little bit quieter, you're going to keep people's attention better. So what we're going for here is variation in the volume. The next one is rhythm. Now, Richard Bandler is incredibly skilled at using rhythm to anchor different concepts. So he will use one rhythm for one concept and another rhythm for another. Some of you have noticed that he taps his foot a lot. He's running rhythms all the time. But you know what the really important thing is just to be able to have rhythm at all. When you hear someone who speaks arrhythmically, I think that what happens is that personally, that is, I tend to switch off because I find it rather annoying to listen to someone who doesn't keep too much of a beat, really. It doesn't sound good. So the inflections we've already worked on and the energy level we've already worked on. The next thing is emphasis. Some people were playing with emphasis. We're going to be working with that tomorrow. If the feedback that you're getting is that people can't remember what you say, then probably you're not giving enough emphasis. When you emphasize a word in a phrase, it tells people's brain how to make sense of it. As soon as you hear the emphasized word, as soon as you hear the emphasized word, your brain does something. And by the way, in NLP, to have those tonal anchors and marked out phrases, you need to be able to be an expert on where you emphasize. Uh, the resonance is whether your voice is up in your head, whether your voice is down in your chest, or whether it's somewhere in the middle. And again, what you want is varied. Nothing is wrong with having head resonance. It just sounds wrong if it's at the wrong moment. It sounds great outside when you want your voice to carry. I'm going to be working with that. A pauses. Really useful. A clarity. Some people have said to me here that they think they could do with being clearer. And that's going to be down to how much muscle energy you use. And again, all these things we're working with tomorrow. And your posture, we've done a little bit on that. And where you put your voice is a part of it as well. Because no matter what volume I use, if I bring my attention too close, it's not going to be easy for you to hear me. You're going to have to work. At the moment, I'm speaking very close, okay? And even if I take my hand away, if I'm thinking and talking at the same time, it feels really different from when I'm focusing on you, doesn't it? Somebody here asked me about keeping people engaged. That's to do with your focus of attention. Your confidence and state and your strong stance. <coughs> now, that's the list. There isn't any more to it, really. If you've worked with all of those things, you're going to have real good vocal control. It's one of the reasons I love working with voices. It's finite, it's simple. Yeah, you can go on improving, but there's only that many aspects of your voice, really. And so, you know, once you've identified which aspect of your voice you really could do with working on, it's just a question of learning what to do and practicing it. So I want you to take a few minutes now to go through that list with a couple of other people to look at your goals and to have a think about which of these vocal aspects might make the difference in where you've been to where you want to be. So for example, you might think it's volume, but maybe there's a bit more to it. Maybe your voice, you know, people, actors can speak on a stage in a whisper and be heard at the back of the room. Okay. So what might it be? Energy. Energy might be in it. What else? Projection. The projection, the placement, where you're actually sending the sound waves might be part of it. 
you can have a quiet voice and be completely distinct. So I want you to have a think before we go into too much detail of what these things mean and what to do with them. And just see, do your best to identify which aspect of voice is going to make the most difference to you. You know, there's a, a concept which I learned in my practitioner course called the elegant solution. Any of you know what that's about? The elegant solution? It's an engineering term, a mathematical term. And, and it means, what do I have to do? What's the minimum I have to do to one side of the equation to have the maximum effect on the other side? I'm always looking for the elegant solution with voices. What's the least that you need to do to get the effect that you want? Have you found some things in today which you think are genuinely, genuinely going to be useful to you? Yes. Yes. I'm really pleased to hear that. 